Hello church. Today we are going to talk about politics. Now since it's just me um, just talking there won't be any sighing or, or moaning or heavy breathing and frustration and it'll be easier to stay on stay away from engaging any specific candidate or party because that is not what this will be about directly. Father God make uh, make these words clear and may the intent be pure may this bring glory to you amen um you'll want to grab your bible um, some paper something to write um, some notes with um, you're going to want to probably go back and dig into this stuff again later there's quite a bit of scripture so there's an american presbyterian minister in the 1800s that said the church must take right ground in regards to politics. God will bless or curse the nation according to the course Christians take. You know, from the moment the first settlers came to America and dedicated this land to the glory of God and the, and the spreading of the Christian faith, the Christian church has played a central role in shaping the governmental structure of our nation. Let's take a look at what God's Word says about civil government and how Christians are to relate to this secular authority. Um, the Bible says more about this issue than, than we may realize. Um, sadly, Christians are that are involved in the political process are often ridiculed and, and mocked as being some sort of fringe group. Um, the radical Christian right. However, these, these critics often overlook the fact that Christians have been on the cutting edge of some of the greatest reforms in history, including the development of many hospitals, charities, and the founding of some of our greatest colleges and universities. From the abolishment of slavery to the civil rights reforms of the, of the 60s, Christians have been on the front lines of making the world a better place for all. Much is said about the separation of church and state. While diving into that is not going to happen today, but there are a number of scriptural principles that should be looked at. While it is true that the Bible teaches that spiritual government, the church, and political government, the state, are two separate institutions. They are to function in ways that are complementary to each other. For example, in, in ancient Israel, Moses was the political leader, while his brother Aaron served in the priesthood as the spiritual leader. Exodus 18, 15 to 16, Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God, when they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I decide between a man and his neighbor. And I make known the decrees of God and his laws. A similar relationship is seen between King Josiah and Hilkah and the, the priest in 2 Kings 22. Another example would be Nehemiah, the governor, and Ezra, the scribe. In Nehemiah 7, 1-7, when the wall had been rebuilt, and I had positioned the doors, and the gatekeepers, and the singers, and the Levites had been appointed. I then put in charge over Jerusalem my brother Hanani, and Hananiah the chief of the citadel. For he was a faithful man, and feared God more than many do. My God placed it on my heart to gather the leaders, the officials, and the ordinary people, so they could be enrolled on the basis of genealogy. And I found the geological records of those who had formerly returned. At Ezra, Nehemiah 8, 1 to 8, all the people gathered together in the plaza, which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which included men and women, and all those able to understand what they heard. So he read it before the plaza in front of the water gate from dawn till noon before the men and women and those children who could understand. All the people were eager to hear the book of the law. 
Ezra the scribe stood on a towering wooden platform constructed for this purpose. Ezra opened the book in plain view of all the people, for he was elevated above them all. When he opened the book, all the people stood up. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people replied, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites were teaching the people the law as the people remained standing. They read from the book of God's law, explaining it and imparting insight. Thus the people gained understanding from what was read. Above all, the highest law is God's law, and he expects all human governments to be subject to it. Psalm 2, 10 to 12. So now you kings, do what is wise. You rulers of the earth, submit to correction. Serve the Lord in fear, repent in terror. Give sincere homage. Otherwise, he will be angry and you will die because of your behavior. When his anger quickly ignites, how blessed are all who take shelter in him. Isaiah 8.20 To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this world, to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, please understand that this isn't preaching politics. Ultimately, genuine change comes through changed hearts, which only occurs as peoples respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, we do still live in a fallen, sinful world, and as we will see, God has ordained the system of civil government to protect the innocent and to maintain proper order. The Christian life carries a prophetic voice that calls us to shine light into dark places. Jesus' call for his people to be salt and light to a dying world covers every aspect of life. This includes how we vote and relate to our government. Matthew 5, 13-14 You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its flavor, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by people. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. Christians are to be peaceful, law-abiding citizens. Romans 13, 1-7, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except by God's appointment. And the authorities that exist have been instituted by God. So the person who resists such authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers cause no fear for good conduct, but for bad. Do you desire not to fear authority? Do good, and you will receive its commendation. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be in fear. For it does not bear the sword in vain. It is God's servant to administer retribution on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of the wrath of the authorities, but also because of your conscience. For this reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants devoted to governing. Pay everyone what is owed, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, Honor to whom honor is due. First Peter 2, 13, 15. Be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake, whether to a king as supreme or to governors as those in commission to punish wrongdoers and praise those who do good. For God wants, us, wants you to silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. 1 Timothy 2, 1-3 tells us that we are to pray for and honor our government leaders. First of all, then, I urge that request, prayers, intercessions, and thanks be offered on behalf of all people, even for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity, such prayer for all is good and welcomed before God our Savior. Matthew twenty-two twenty-one says, Faithfully pay your taxes, 
right? Give to Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and to God the things which are God's. We are to work for the highest good of all people. Proverbs 3.27 Do not withhold good from those who need it when you have the ability to help. Galatians 6.10 Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And this includes working to promote godly principles in politics and government. Proverbs 29.2 When the godly are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are in power, they groan. See, I was, as we read Romans 13 earlier, it is a key text in understanding what the scriptures say about the relation of civil and spiritual authority. In that passage, we saw that civil government is ordained by God to punish evil and preserve the peace in society. It even goes as far as to call government servants ministers of God. Obviously, they don't always live up to it, but that is still God's goal and standard. In light of this, the Bible calls us to obey all civil laws, unless these laws are in direct violation of the laws and commandments of God. Peter and John tell us in Acts 4.19, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey them rather than God. There are a number of people in the Bible that God specifically called to work for change in the political and governmental arena. This includes men and women, well, such as Joseph, Genesis 41, 39 to 41. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, because God has enabled you to know all this, there is no one as wise and discerning as you are. You will oversee my household, and all my people will submit to your commands. Only I, the king, will be greater than you. See here, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I place you in authority over all the land of Egypt. Uh, there's Deborah in Judges 5, 1 to 7. <laughs> Warriors were scarce. They were scarce in Israel. Until you arose, Deborah, until you arose as a motherly protector in Israel. Gideon in Judges 6, 11 to 14. The Lord's messenger appeared and said to him, The Lord is with you, courageous warrior. And Gideon said to him, Pardon me, but if the Lord is with us, why has such disaster overtaken us? Where are all his miraculous deeds our ancestors told us about? You know, they said that, Did the Lord not bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Median. Then the Lord himself turned to him and said, You have the strength. Deliver Israel from the power of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? We have Samuel, David, Nehemiah. We have Daniel. In our day and age, there are a number of avenues through which we can work for change in civil authority. One important way that we can take advantage of it is Election Day. The God-given privilege of voting is something we should never take for granted. Keep in mind that uh, following Jesus transcends blind loyalty to a political party. And to a degree, there is room among Christians for some honest difference of opinions in regard to politics. Nevertheless, there are some biblical principles that God requires us all to follow when it comes to stands we take. These, these biblically mandated issues include speaking out for innocent lives. Proverbs 31.8 Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are perishing. This includes unborn children. Psalms 139, 13 to 16. Your eyes saw me when I was inside the womb. All the days ordained for me were recorded in your scroll before one of them came into existence. Isaiah 44, 2. God who made you has something to say to you. The God who formed you in the womb wants to help you. 
don't be afraid. Jeremiah 1 5 I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb before you were born I set you apart and appointed you as my spokesman to the world we are mandated to confront sin and moral decay Proverbs 14 34 God devotion makes a country song strong <laughs> makes a country song uh, God avoidance leaves people weak Isaiah 520 destruction is certain for those who say that evil is good and good is evil that dark is light and light is dark that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter Jonah 1 2 he's told to get up and go to the great city of Nineveh announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are we are mandated to defending the poor and the oppressed Psalm 10 2 the wicked arrogantly chase the oppressed the oppressed are trapped by the schemes the wicked have dreamed up Isaiah 10 1 to 2 those who enact unjust policies are as good as dead those who are always instituting unfair regulations to keep the poor from getting fair treatment and to deprive the oppressed among my people of justice so they can steal what widows own and, and loot what belongs to orphans Amos 2 6 to 7 because Israel has committed three covenant uh, covenant transgressions make that four I will not revoke my decree of judgment they sold the innocent for silver the needy for a pair of sandals they trample on the dirt covered heads of the poor they push the destitute away a man and his father go to the same girl. In this way, they show disrespect for my moral purity. We are mandated to work toward the peace and blessing of Israel. Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 27, 29. May people serve you and nations honor you you will master your brothers and your mother's sons will honor you those who curse you will be cursed those who bless you will be blessed psalm 122 6 pray for the peace of jerusalem may those who love her prosper secondly contrary to popular belief character does count when choosing our leaders exodus 18 21 and 22 gives us a good model to follow but you choose from the people capable men God-fearing men of truth those who hate bribes and put them over the people as rulers of thousands rulers of hundreds rulers of fifties and rulers of tens they will judge the people under normal circumstances and every difficult case they will bring to you but every small case they themselves will judge so that you may make it easier for yourself and they will bear the burden with you these passages show us that civil leaders are to be able men who fear God men of truth hating covetousness uh, greed if our country had always followed these common sense guidelines when casting our votes we would be a much stronger nation today the Bible describes leaderships as being a sacred trust and placing a person in such a position is a very serious thing for example in 1st Timothy 522 Paul instructs the young pastor Timothy to lay hands suddenly on no man to ordain him in the ministry neither be a partaker of other men's sins in other words if if we prematurely put a person into leadership who is not worthy of it we risk bearing the guilt of that person's sin now what does this have to do with voting as mentioned earlier the Bible also describes government leaders as being ministers of God in this case we ordain our leaders by our votes our support and influence if we support politicians who support ungodly causes or promote immoral behavior God holds us responsible for that. To bid a person 
Godspeed and their sin is to become a partaker of that same sin. 2 John 11, that would just give him a platform to perpetuate his evil ways, making you his partner. That's a very sobering thought. Finally, we can never fall into the trap of substituting political involvement for the gospel. We must recognize that politics can never be an instrument of salvation. While we can and should work for positive change, this is at best a, a band-aid solution. See, at the root, a nation's problems are always spiritual in nature. And when it comes to it, it, eternal issues, simply moralizing our culture is not enough. Winning people to our political causes is not enough. People can embrace all the Christianized cultural influences in the world, but without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we are all still totally lost. It has to start with each of us as individuals. God gives us that wonderful promise in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen that if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We can all start right where we are. Psalm thirty-three, twelve: How blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord the people whom he has chosen to be his special possession. Father God, as we struggle to keep you in front of us, uh, over us, we sometimes lose sight that you have chosen us individually as your special possession. We are your inheritance. <laughs> wow. May we strive to be a worthy investment. You traded Jesus' life for our own. May we walk in obedience for you. In Jesus' name, amen.